you helped to create internet banking, which when it was created was an industry everybody thought people are going to lose their jobs, nobody's going to use it, and we're all going to get hacked. Seems like there's some similarities. So tell me what you learned about the creation of internet banking that informs your life and work now. Yeah, um, so it's a little over 20 years ago, and I uh, ran the tech lab at, uh, at uh, Citibank in uh, California. And we were very proud to create internet banking. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people came to me and say, wow, this is cool, but you know, you're wasting your time. Because nobody's ever gonna do their banking on the internet. It's not secure, you know. Uh, and then, it's true, for the first couple of years, things went slowly. And then it, it reached the tipping point. And now about, I think, 99% of all customers are using internet banking. But we did something else. We, at that time, we recognized that, you know, banking actually was a consumer industry. So we thought that we should craft our products and services around the needs of people. So instead of doing a car loan or a mortgage, or we said, okay, let's look at the financial needs and package. And we came up with around 2,000 products. And to me, there are a lot of parallels to healthcare. You know, when you, when you look at your population, your patients, you start looking at the real needs of those patients, which typically are both clinical and behavior then you can craft completely different ways of engaging with them. If you now know that 80% of the care is around chronic disease, and you know chronic disease is with you every day, every night, 24 hours, uh, so you have to then craft a system that's with you 24-7 mm -hmm. and that really understands you so that you can provide the right care. Uh, so that's, that's what we call the consumerization of health, where it's really about you as a person and your health needs and how the system can cater to it. So let me keep running with this parallel between banking and healthcare. The way banking used to work when I was a kid is you do basically everything you needed to do at the bank and you do much less. Yeah. Now the way it works is you do much more, right? I interact with my mobile app all the time yeah. and I go in the bank when there's a terrible problem. Is that what's going to happen in healthcare too? We're going to kind of like do it all in our home until we get hit by a car and then we'll go to the hospital? Yeah, so, you know, so, uh, a big insurer told me that they actually spent time at the gate of the hospital. And they came to the conclusion that about 80% of the people entering into the hospital could either be avoided to come to the hospital or could be helped elsewhere, mm -hmm. you know, clearly at home as well, if the system would support it. Yeah. So the hospital should become the place where you really go for specialist care or truly acute situation. And then, you know, what I keep saying is the hospital of the future is actually a network and mm -hmm. you provide the care in the network at the place that makes most sense to do the intervention. Um, so we start looking at health as being provided through a network. And of course, the hospital is a hub in the network, but it's not necessarily the place where you do most of the work. So for instance, um, we're not showing you here, but we have to, those cat labs. And that's one of our biggest growing businesses where you, you basically come in and they insert a stand or open up a valve or apply um, localized medication with, uh, with a balloon. Uh, but our fastest selling cat labs are not in hospitals. You know where they are? Shopping malls. So people are setting up cat labs in shopping malls. You know, these are cardiologists that set up their own uh -huh. company because they move the care to where people are. Because people come to the shopping mall. So you get a stent put in at the shopping mall, that's the future? Yeah, you, you just sign up, you go there, they, they do a first assessment, it, they have these you know, automated tools, they have yes. the app that prepares you for the procedure. Then they do the procedure, they send you home, they track you when you're home. There's no hospital needed. Mm -hmm. So this right. is here and now, I'm not talking about something that's 10 years out. Uh, I am, when I get a stent, I'm going to do it at a hospital, but I'm happy to know that it can be done at the shopping mall. Yeah, but if, if the best cardiologists do it, you know, it's... I'm old-fashioned, man. Yeah, yeah. All right, so... How... <laughs> Disappointing, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to just watch a YouTube video and do it myself, man. That's how I'm going to do it. All right, so 10 years from now, how's it going to work? So I'm going to, if I get sick, 
I'm gonna have all these little devices on me. It'll tell me whether I just have the flu, I don't need to go to the hospital, or it'll tell me I have Lyme disease, I need to go in. Like, what is the level of self-diagnosis that I'll be able to do? And how will I do that self-diagnosis without driving myself crazy on some yeah. Reddit thread that says I'm about to die? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good question. So just having the data will not do the trick because right. you will get confused. So that's why we need doctors. You know, we need doctors to, to really assess the situation. So yes, you will have trackers. Mm -hmm. and and they may be in places that you don't want to talk about, but you will have trackers and they will stream and that information will be put in the context of your medical history. Wait, wait, and I'm going to have trackers in places I don't want to talk about that stream. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. The future of healthcare is amazing. <laughs> anyway, keep going. But it will be put in, you know, uh, it will be put in context because um, it will understand who you are, where you're coming from. It may even understand where your parents are coming from and their parents are coming from because a lot of it is coded in our, our genome. Mm -hmm. So um, all of that is relevant information in the way we can help you take care of yourself. Now, there are always people that say, I don't want it, that's fine. But there will be a whole bunch of people that say, I want it because I want to live you know, 20 years lo longer. I don't, I, if I have a chronic disease, then I want to be able to control that chronic disease way better than I do today. You know, my daughter has type one diabetes. And the difference between what the system can do to help her and the help she's getting is huge. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, she has a continuous glucose meter, um, she has a pump, she has other relevant information, and nothing is connected. And then she's talking to a doctor that has only a snapshot of the situation. So there's not a holistic view. So it's very hard for her to be in, um, you know, what we, what we tend to call the sweet spot, where she feels good, where her sugars are under control. And this applies to any chronic disease. It applies to heart failure patients. It applies to people with mental disorders. So, so I think we're only scratching the surface of what we can so, do here. So give me more specifics about the kind of trackers we'll have in five years and the data they'll have and the kind of care they can do. And like, what is the upper limit of care that I will be able to do in my apartment in five years? Well, if you, if you look here, um, so one, one of the things we show is a wearable patch. Mm -hmm. And that's the future of monitoring. So, you know, if you're in ICU, you're on all these machines that beep. Uh, when you get discharged from the ICU, you, for instance, you go into general ward, you can start walking around. So what they do today, they come in with spot monitors every yeah. couple of hours. So that's a snapshot. Now, say so you just wear the patch, you wear it on your heart. It will track, you know, your key vital signs, your heart rate, your heart rhythm, your respiratory rate, you know, uh -huh. SpO2. But it also has fall detection. So, you know, if, uh, because see. you're frail, if a person falls, then immediately an alert goes out. And presumably you can tell when you're about to fall too, right? Yeah, get ahead. exactly. So we, we can now even predict if somebody's going to fall. So if you're wearing this for a couple of days, so it's being calibrated, and suddenly your and gait is blood changing. Level yeah, too. pardon? It measures blood alcohol level too, so you can control uh, not, whether not you're Not but I'm pretty sure we can do that. Okay, keep going. <laughs> uh, I'm just but, trying but, to help. <laughs> but we can already predict if somebody yeah. you know, suddenly has an increase probability of falling because the gait has changed, they're getting up more slowly, and it's an early indication. Mm -hmm. You know, heart arrhythmia is a very important indicator that calls for an intervention. So if we can have these people at home wearing something like this, A, we reduce the risk of falling, uh, but more importantly, we can, you know, see deterioration happening. Yep. And typically you have a window. Typically you have, let's say, 24 hours to intervene and you can typically intervene with medication. So if right. that happens at home, you may e even not notice it, but you get a call and say, hey, somebody's on his way with a new dose of uh, medication to help you avoid an impending heart attack. And then you also massively reduce false positives, the number of people who come into the hospital and they have indigestion, but they think exactly. they're having a heart attack. I, I think that's one. Of, so one of the big things we can do is make sure we get the right people to the hospital yeah. and make sure that we don't get people to the hospital uh, because we just want to do the test there or, or track them. And, you know, it's great. I go to the doctor every quarter because I have hypertension, which runs in the family, by the way. And then I go there and they check my blood pressure. Yeah. I said, you know, this is like the ultimate snapshot. Right. <laughs> what about all these days, you know, 
I need to be tracked. I, I, I want to understand where am I heading with this? What can I do to control it? You know, I, I did a full body checkup the, uh, the other day and I get a report that's like 10 pages where they did, was really well done. Yeah. And the last sentence was, we hope to see you again next year. You know, uh -huh. like, <laughs> okay, I hope so too. But, <laughs> but what I'm trying to say yeah. is there's a whole bunch of observations, but there's no follow through. Right. There's not like, okay, we're going to help this guy get in control and we're going to give him the tools to get in control. And, and I'm, I'm not a hard case, you know. I, I, I'm not like my daughter who has a lot of complications or my dad who, you know, has been operated on from colon cancer nine times. Yeah. Uh, so there are these cases that can really, really be helped by, you know, helping them give better control over their life, get them to the hospital when it's needed at the right time, but also intervene proactively when required. All right, so how does, First off, what do we need to have this happen, right? So in Manhattan, one in four people doesn't have internet access, right? Because America has screwed up broadband. So how do you make it so that this is... Is, is, is this true? It's true. It's crazy. One in four? One in four in Manhattan. And they don't have it on their phone either? You can have it on your phone, right? You have, but you don't have broadband in your yeah. apartment, right? It's crazy because we've screwed up telecom. Yeah, but who needs broadband in your home? We, uh, well, we have 4G. You know, your tracking yes, devices. All right, well, anyway, <laughs> point being, how do you make it so that this is available for everybody, yeah. right? So that it's not just available for people who can afford nice smartphones and good sensoring systems and fast broadband. Yeah, and I, I think that's a big question. It's uh, even a bigger question in the U.S. You know, what are your basic rights yeah. in terms of access to the right care? What are your basic rights? Yeah, I think you know having right to high-speed internet is almost like a basic right. I'm with you. It's uh, so you know I think it's a responsibility to make sure that of a government mm -hmm. or to, to provide that, that access, you know, to a world-class digital infrastructure. And, uh, and we know that, that, you know, economies prosper mm -hmm. when they have, you know, ubiquitous access to high-speed internet. But how much when you are thinking about the products you design, how much of it is, ah, this will be amazing, it's going to be super expensive for a long time, but eventually it'll trickle down and everybody yeah. gets it. Or how much of it is, oh, we can do this and it will help everybody. Yeah, I, I think we're looking at both. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had a very interesting challenge. So we, we, we basically said by 2025, we want to improve the lives of 3 billion people. And since we're a health company, immediately you say, okay, there's 2 billion people who don't have access to just really basic care. Yeah. And, and then we started looking at in places like Kenya or Uganda, um, or Indonesia, where they have 15,000 islands. How do you provide access to care? But how do you do that in a business model that works? So, mm -hmm. so we've been challenging ourselves to create solutions that are at such a low price point right. that we can truly make it ubiquitous. And clearly the way to do it is through the phone. Yep. And we are assuming with this that there will be ubiquitous use of smartphones. Mm -hmm. and we will put a lot of intelligence in the network. So, for instance, now you're a, a young pregnant woman on one of the islands in Indonesia. Yeah. And you're getting on the phone and you're telling them, okay, what are you feeling? And yeah. I have pain here and I couldn't sleep last night. And, you know, I, I took blood pressure because the, the woman in the, in the village has a blood pressure. And we say, oh, give us all that information. We'll help you interpret and give you some simple guidance, mm -hmm. which can be largely AI driven because mm -hmm. you know, 80% of the problem of you know, pregnant moms are, are kind of well known and yeah. easy to solve. So then with that, you solve a lot of the you know, basic healthcare issues at a very low cost because you leverage the mobile network and you make AI in the network Mm -hmm. The cost, you know, the additional cost of adding a patient is zero. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at these ma models where the more intelligence we put in the network, the lower the cost of providing extras to large numbers of people because you're no longer constrained by time and place. All right, so you're an ex your example of the pregnant woman in Indonesia, the intelligence you're putting into the network is the ability to analyze the information she says, exactly. or is it sensors you're actually building into an app on no, the we, phone? No, we do both. So what, what we've done is we created what we call the midwife backpack. Uh -huh. So in the backpack, there's some basic stuff, a blood pressure cuff, a weight scale, uh, but also a little Doppler that we developed 
because an ultrasound is too expensive. But a Doppler can still get some information about the fetus. So all that information is entered on the smartphone, is then sent to the cloud where it's being interpreted, and you know, advice is being passed back. If it's a complex case, then it's put to an uh, OBGYN doctor. Mm -hmm. So there's an OBGYN doctor sitting behind the screen that's looking at all these incoming information and then we'll, say, we'll pass you know, instructions back to the midwife. So, but that OBGYN doctor doesn't need to have the people physically in his office. So he can do a lot of cases. He can do 10 times more cases than yeah. when a woman comes into his of or her yeah. office. So, so you're changing the model that way. So you're giving the midwife the tools to do a lot of observation, to do a first pass triage for exceptions. You're sending it to Jakarta where, uh -huh. the, where the specialist can look at it and then send back instructions. All right, so you made a big mistake with this interview is that right before we started, you said to me, there's so many interesting, complicated ethical issues we're going to face. So what are those? What are like the most, we have five minutes left before we move to Q&A. What are the most complicated ethical issues that you're going to have to deal with in your line of work in the next couple of years? Well, I, I, I think what we see, so if you talk about uh, precision medicine, and we're, we're investing heavily in precision diagnostics. So, yep. You know, we can already see a lot on an image. On an image, we look at a cancer, we can quantify the cancer, we can even see how aggressive it is by interpreting through AI the image, and we can identify this may be the best place to extract cancerous tissue to be looked at by pathologists. So we extract the tissue, pathologists will look at it. We now do it through digital pathology. So let's say if it's a brain tumor, we can send it over the network, at a pathologist somewhere in the network that's a specialist in brain tumor. He will interpret it, we use AI to identify and biomark it. Yep. And then we can do a genomics on the cancer. So now we become very precise about what drives the cancer, how aggressive is it. We can even now start predicting how will it metastasize. Yep. And now you can look, there are all these therapies that are becoming available, you know, immunotherapy or immuno and chemo. And as you get more specific about the cancer, you know, the treatment may become more expensive. Uh -huh. And so if you look at some of the immunotherapies that have been launched, you know, they're like between 250,000, 500,000. And we'll see more and more of that because we become more precise. Right. The therapy will become more expensive because it's a smaller oh, and see. smaller, you know, section of the population. And therefore the cost will be expensive. So then the question becomes, Who's going to pay for it? Yeah. Where does it stop? So actually, these, these are real et ethical questions. So if you have slightly less information, you can cure a larger number of people at a lower cost slightly less yeah. well. But at no point do we ever stop and say, let's get slightly less information. We always want more, of course. but then that narrows the sample and you end yeah. up charging way more. So the more precise we become, and we will, because yeah. this is going to happen. You can, you can go to Craig Venter in San Diego and do a $20,000 you know, DNA, full body MR, you know, you can completely diagnose yourself and then they come up with the best way to deal with it. So, you know, you pay out of, out of pocket for that. So where do, we, where do we stop in diagnosis? But more importantly, who's going to pay for these expenses? Where do you come with Because the it's going to happen. We're, we're going to be so precise that, that we're going to know how to, how to treat this. So this we'll end up at this stage where you'll go and you'll be like, I'd like to diagnose my cancer. I'd like moderate precision and low cost, or I'd like, like super high precision and high cost. Is that where we're headed? I, I don't know. You know, this, I'm not a, an ethical specialist, but I, I think this is for real. These, yeah. we, need to find, we need to find answers to these questions because technology is going to take us there.